Live from the Improv Studios in Hollywood, California, it's the Nighttime Show with Stephen Kramer Glickman. Tonight, the show welcomes head writer Matt Walker, the director of the podcast documentary Earbuds, co-creator of L.A. Podfest, comedy film nerds, Graham Elwood. And now, the man who just churns like butter until he has time to love you, Put your hands together for Stephen Kramer Glickman. Yay. Hey. Hi, everybody. Well, Mike, uh, that was wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I love you, buddy. Thank you. I'm All right. Now. now get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> he stuck around just long enough to do the intro. And he's like, I'm out of here. I like that. Do your intro, then pack it up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Graham, I'm uh, I'm so happy that you're here. Thanks for having me. Um, dude. I've been on your podcast a couple times, yes. uh, comedy film nerds, mm-hmm. and uh, it's right up my alley. And I have your book, uh, guys. If you uh, can, you buy this book. Where can you buy the book? You can buy the book at comedyfilmnerds.com or on Amazon. Yeah, the, the this is a fantastic book. I've been reading through, and it's one of these really enjoyable things that I I love uh, is is books about movies where you mm-hmm. can just it's a guide. It's a guide, mm-hmm. and it's a, it's called the comedy film nerds guide to movies it's written by you and chris mancini our our dear friend uh doug benson Mm -hmm. is uh does the forward for it and then it's got amazing uh you know writers in there it's got dave anthony uh alan hervey alan havey alan havey yeah jackie cation yeah Yeah, uh jackie cation who's amazing greg proops who writes an amazing section in this uh and and lots of other really really funny people and it's i i love it we're going to talk more about the book how's everything going with you you've been good it's been good dude just uh what have i been doing i've been summer's been nice i've been doing some surfing in the beautiful pacific ocean really that's been nice how's that going uh great have you done surfing a lot in your life, or is it a new thing? I started doing it about 10 years ago. Okay. So I grew up in Chicago, so no, I was not surfing yeah. there. I had the surfing skills of like a you know a hot dog vendor that sold Polishes outside of Comiskey Park. <laughs> but then I moved uh, to Southern California and uh, was shooting a commercial for DirecTV a little over 10 years ago. I had just moved to Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. And this one of the camera guys, you know, was like, "So you live in Santa Monica now? So do you surf? You live by the beach?" I said, "Well, no. I mean, I kind of boogie board and stuff." And he went, "Well, nobody ever picked up a chick with a boogie board under their arm." Yeah. <laughs> and that's when I started taking surf lessons. Mm-hmm. That's when things. <laughs> that's when things changed. Wow, <laughs> that is true. That's great. But uh, no, it's it's um yeah, surfing's been a lot of fun. And then I was on the road a little bit, and then just getting ready for. Uh, Los Angeles Podcast Festival. Mm-hmm. September. Yeah. When, when does that start? September 23rd through the 25th. Ooh. Yeah. It's 40, 40 podcasts, six panels. It's three days. It's a nonstop party. Where does it all take place? Uh, the Sofitel in Beverly Hills. Cool. Um, so there's so still cool. three day passes, some day passes left. Where the tickets are, we've sold more tickets now than we ever have. So awesome. it's good. Last year sold out. So this year will sell out too. How many times have you done this? This is year five. Wow. Yeah. I know. You, we, we talked about, uh, your people reached out about having us come yeah. do the show, but the weekend of uh, that that yeah, weekend the, is yeah. is the weekend that my movie comes out. Yeah, so, so I know you, we, we wanted to like, get you in, but you were like, "Oh man, his movie I comes out just, that Friday." We do our live show that Saturday. Yeah, yeah. So it's a busy. It's, it's gonna be a little. It's gonna us. be a little intense. Yeah, but next year. But yeah, hell we'll yeah, out, dude. Man. We'll yeah, get you if in you there. You want us to be there? We'll be there, man. Unless you're in another movie next year on the same weekend. Just pick a different release date. That's all I ask. Knock on wood. Listen, Warner Brothers, I'll do your movie <laughs> but we gotta check the schedule There's when you're releasing it first <laughs> i have to do the la pod fest <laughs> you sons of bees you better let me do my pods um yeah it's our fifth year it's been a, it's been so much fun you know uh hopefully you guys i yeah. mean it's awesome we got a movie coming out but come by next no, no, year no, no. What it's are some so of the shows? cool it's what so are, this year we've got uh welcome to night vale oh uh, big one. Yeah, criminal which is mm-hmm. a giant show Ow. um this new show, uh, Karen Kilgariff uh, and this fr- and her friend Georgia do this My Favorite Murder, which oh, is yeah. one of the top shows. And then we've got Aisha Tyler in the festival, Todd Love Glass, Jimmy Pardo. Oh, yeah. Uh, Pardo's on our show on Saturday. Dude, he's, yeah. you know, I mean, I I've known him. these guys for years. And, um, you know, it's it's great. We just had on Comedy Filmers, Julia Prescott does this podcast called Everything's Coming Up Podcast. It's all about The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. So, like, it, it, it's just, it's it's... A three day, I always, I always, it's like a, I feel like I'm going to a high school reunion in a sense, in the best sense, like I'm seeing all these comics, a lot of them, 
you know, we're all busy. We're on the road. Yeah. I don't see a lot of my friends. And then sure. this weekend, everybody's hanging out. You've got people flying in from literally all over the world. Like wow. the hotel rooms at the Sofitel are, they're so selling out. We've sold mm -hmm. more hotel rooms than we've ever done. It's, oh it's, my gosh. it's so much fun. And we've created this really cool, fun community, the podcast community. That's great. Um, and we always, you know, we have some of our favorites every year, but then we always try to bring in new shows, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and because I want, the reason I invited you and we'll have you at some point is I want you to see the LA podcast scene. You get a nice glimpse of it here at the improv. You know sure, what I mean? Yeah, a little bit, but I want everyone to kind of see it's like, and welcome to night Vale has done it in the past and they're, they're in New York and they're like, man, they came to us. They're like, we want to come back, do our show and hang out. I want to be guests mm -hmm. on all these different shows. It's like, a, you know, That's when you so go to a music great. festival and, and, and they're like, yeah. you know, the guitarist from this band is jamming Jam with this one. Jamming here, yeah. yeah. Right. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's a blast. We have an opening night party. There's a big stand-up show Saturday night. Wow. There's a DJ party by the pool. Like, we're having, we're just, it's it's a blast. That sounds great. That's yeah. so fun. So if you go to LAPodFest.com, you can get tickets. And so, then, here's the other great thing. Sure, please. Uh, we do a live video pay-per-view of the whole event, so you can watch all 40 shows and panels all weekend. Then we archive the videos for 30 days after. Mm -hmm. That costs $25. But wait! Using coupon code CFN, you can save five bucks. <laughs> but wait, hey. there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> now how much would you pay? Uh, <laughs> I've become a constant pitch man because I can't get a job in TV. Um, but yeah, so that's it's it's uh, it's the coolest thing. And it's, you know, you guys know this from being pot. You have fans sure. all over the world. Yeah. It's yeah. the coolest. Yeah. It's the coolest thing. And I, I just... It's I love doing it. It's such an empowering thing as an artist. Mm -hmm. Having done, uh, you know, you were talking before that I've, you know, I've done game shows and TV and all this stuff, yeah. and those that's great. I'd gladly do it again. But you know, a TV show can get canceled. Sure, yeah, they, someone can just fire you, or, or yeah, something. you never know what'll happen on those. There's something really interesting about doing a podcast that we're. Uh, I'm just, I just, we, we, I just worked with. Uh, we had Casper Van Dien mm -hmm. from Starship Troopers, right? So nice. we sat down, we interviewed him for like an hour, twenty minutes or so, and then I called him and I was like, "Do you want to come shoot a sketch with me for Loot Crate?" And he was like, "Yeah, absolutely." Yeah, and he showed up, and he was wonderful, mm -hmm. and. We know each other now because he did the podcast. Right. I yeah. have all this knowledge about him. He has all this knowledge about me. And now we have this relationship. And that's how it's been with every single person that we've had on the show. Oh, dude, it's yes. It extends it's relationship. It's like, because uh, before this, it'd be like, oh, maybe you do stand up with someone a bunch of times and then that's about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. But uh, but this is so different. It's so much more involved. And honestly, like I, I, that's a great example. Kevin Pollack has done comedy mm -hmm. film nerds a bunch. He's in the She's festival amazing. this year, yeah. wow. which is great. He's like a buddy. We've become buddies. Like, hey, Kevin, like, hey, guy from all of these amazing films, you know? Yeah, like, that's huge. Do you want to come in Chris's garage and talk about movies? <laughs> like, <laughs> That's outrageous. And that's what's so cool. You know, he he bugged us. Kevin Pollack is like, hey, can we? Can I be in your festival? Wow. You know? Here's what you do. You'd be like, okay, Kevin, but first you have to do your William Shatner impression for me on the phone right now. Actually, well, <laughs> I always ask him to do Christopher Walken. Oh, like, Christopher Walken. Okay, yeah. So come to, the, come to PodFest yeah. because I will corner him and be like, so... Well, how would Christopher Walken <laughs> talk about the yeah. Sofitel or whatever? What does he think of the Beverly <laughs> Center? Have to think. I was at the food court, and I, I do a horrible one. Amazing. Word. Hey, uh, real quick before we continue, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm having such a great time. Like this is so great, and I I love uh, Graham. I'm so happy that you're here. But uh, before we continue, just um, Matt, I forgot to tell you, I uh, last night I had a a little uh, fireball moment. <laughs> Another one? Yeah. Well, you know, I've been. I'm having a lot of fun recently. They're and, a lot uh, of fun. They're great. I love the fireball. They really are. They really are. Glazer, you know anything about this? About these fireball moments? Oh, real fun time. Oh, they're so great. What happens is, is uh, when you drink fireball whiskey, then you know things just get a little uh, mm -hmm. crazier. Like like life just gets a little brighter and mm -hmm. more exciting. So where were and, you? Well, I was at a Sportsman's Lodge. You know that oh, yeah. place? The you used old... to do stand up on a patio. Oh god! Where you get heckled by buses driving by. <laughs> ah! Ah! <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's what happened is um we were, I was there and I was hanging out, you know, just uh, just you know, relaxing. I had a couple of drinks, a couple of shots of fireball and uh I took a little wander around. I was doing a little little wander into this little forest mm -hmm. behind Sportsman's Lodge. Do you oh, know there's, there's a, a forest, forest back there? No, there's a forest over we there. You find Ooh. so many weird forests in oh, LA. No, there's it's a amazing. lot of forests. There's a lot of greenery out here. I'm wandering around through the forest. I'm having a nice little time. I have a bottle of Fireball mm -hmm. with me as per usual. And I'm walking around and uh, 
What do I see? But uh, I saw a fairy. Really? Yeah, it was just floating did, did there. You, did you talk to it? What happened? Yeah, I was like, hey, are you real? I'm real. I'm I'm just as real as you are. Wow, you're so bright. Oh, well, that's because I came from heaven. Oh, my gosh. That's incredible. Yeah. Is that where all fairies are from? Well, we live everywhere. Some live in heaven, and some live in the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that that's where they live. That's so mm. fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, so what are you doing out here in the forest? You having a good time? Well, I came for you. You did? Yes, well, I came with a message. Oh, you did? Well, mm-hmm. What's the message? Little Mr. Glickman hopping through the forest, <laughs> scooping up the field mice and popping them out the head. You can't do that. Put down your fireball, time to sober up. Oh, <laughs> I love that song. <laughs> hey, you want to, you want a quick, you want, would, would you like, hey, Fairy, would you like a shot of this fireball whiskey? Yeah. All right, here you go. Try it out. Oh, wow, that just goes right down. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> and then I made sweet, sweet love to that fairy in the woods. Uh, and, uh, 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 <laughs> it was the greatest experience of my life. Fireball whiskey. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the show. Amazing. But no, the other thing, too, that, that I love sure. from podcasting is... And when I did the, I directed this documentary, Earbuds, the podcasting documentary mm-hmm. that's coming out too. I got to interview a lot of podcasters and fans. And I learned, like Aisha Tyler brought up a great point when I interviewed her. She said, I don't sit down and have an hour long conversation every week with members of my own family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, think about that. Like, you know, like Stephen, you and I, we haven't known each other that long, but we've, like had these long in-depth conversations. So it's either like there's there's two things that happen. You meet new people like we've done Mm -hmm. and you're like friends now. And we all, we have these common interests. We love these movies and stuff like that. And then there's also like comics I haven't seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just, why don't you just come on the podcast and we'll catch up that way. And it's like, you you just like can reconnect with them and what have you been up to? And it's, it's, it's very nice. Yeah, it's it's like a, a building a relationship in a pressure cooker because it's all just like condensed down. Right. Because like the the relationship you build with somebody, if you're just seeing them at shows you're doing and stuff, it's going to take you a year to get to a certain point of friendship. And you do a couple podcasts with somebody, and all of a sudden, like you want to hang right. out at that point. Well, you know, you know who they are. Like you have a really good sense of what they're about, right. and it's it's such a cool. I mean, I've done over 300 episodes of TV and I've never had a connection with other other people as guests on the show and then also with the fans. I mean, there's some fans that have now become like friends. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, like we interviewed this woman, Sanai, who lives in Tokyo and she's like in the fest, she's in the documentary and she's like a friend, she's a friend of mine now. She's not just somebody that listens to the show. It's And it's, it's such a cool, we've literally mm-hmm. connected. So you're saying if somebody wants to stalk a celebrity more- effectively become a big fan of their podcast <laughs> and then you can just weasel your way right in there. <laughs> well, I think that what happens too though is is because it's such a conversation, it's so personal. Yeah. I think the fan the big shiny veneer of of celebrity kind of comes down to where I think yeah. you have less people like being weirdo stalker. Like I think, yeah. It, yeah. I think it, it's, well, I think of, the listener feels like they're in the conversation. Right, they're, they're just not saying anything. You right. are in the conversation. Yeah. Yes. You are Michael. I'm in your head. <laughs> Michael. I'm looking at you. Michael. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Michael. I'm looking at you, Michael. Um, all right. Let's yeah. talk about where you, how did you get, where did you get started? What was the, what was the first from Chicago? You said I'm from Chicago originally. Um, I actually started, uh, I was a freshman at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. Mm-hmm. And oh, that's a big, fun town. Oh, that was that's a, a blast. fun school. That was so, so much fun. Growing what up in the Midwest with the place. shitty weather, and then you go there and it's, it's like always sunny. It's like U of A and ASU are the two biggest party schools I think oh, I've ever been to. It was like, a country just, club college. I had yeah, I got credit to play golf. I was like in a golf <laughs> class. That's the kind of challenging <laughs> I had. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I went to Carnegie Mellon. It was not fun. <laughs> it was not a fun school. <laughs> that does not sound like a fun place to go to school. I didn't have fun for one instant when I was in college. That's all I did was have fun. 
Yeah, um, I went to a musical theater conservatory in New York, so oh. it was just uh, I was one of uh, a lot of back rubs. I was, a lot of it was literally I was one of like four straight guys that went to the school. <laughs> yeah. Well, you must have. So I up. just got laid all the time. Yeah, yeah. musical theater girls. Oh, that's not yeah. a real thing that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. It was not. It was just as bad as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, it was not. Yeah. Good. But so U of A, you went there. What, so yeah, what was I your was, major? There? I was having a nonstop sex party in Arizona. Oh my lord! Yeah. Speaking of nonstop sex parties, <laughs> yeah. Jen Kirkman just walked in. Jen Kirkman just walked in. Yeah. Bye, bye, Jen. Bye, Jen. Good to see that, you. That's the that's what that's the podcast community. Yeah. Jen Kirkman walks in, and we have a nonstop sex party. There yes, we go. That's, that's what, what I'm talking right. about. Um, because yeah. she was downstairs doing her podcast at the lab at the Hollywood Improv. Isn't that yeah. so, so much fun? To answer, yes. I, I was a freshman at the University of Arizona, mm-hmm. and some of the guys in the dorm who were like me and a couple other guys, we were the funniest guys in the dorm, and we were right. like, we should do an open mic night or something. So then there was this competition. It was the Doritos Sticklets, which is a, a defunct gum company. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Yes. So chips and gum go great together. Oh, <laughs> of course. So, so, was it Doritos flavored gum? No, there were two. It was Doritos and Sticklets. Oh, and gum in two, a single package? No, two. Oh. No, separate companies. Oh, two separate things. companies. Okay. Just add, like sponsoring an event together. Just like if oh. Coke and Ford sponsored something, okay. it wouldn't be no, a Ford-flavored it. Coke. Does I that make it. sense? It'd be I got like, it. Be like, <laughs> Although I would probably drink Ford-flavored Coke to try it out. <laughs> it'd be like if Fireball Whiskey and right. Ford decided right. to like work together for an event. Yeah. It'd be weird. You wouldn't be like, this Ford drives like a weird I don't think alcohol. you can have alcohol and cars mixed in that you way. Can't. It's probably a bad idea. Yeah, just like you can't have gum and nachos mixed. Yeah, that is like a bad Exactly. Really bad. But yeah. somebody tried for the U.S. college comedy <laughs> competition idea. in the late 80s. Oh, God. Wow. That's so um, good. The MC of the college comedy competition was a gentleman uh, in a mullet and acid wash jeans. Yes. And his name is Judd Apatow. Holy wow. shit. What? Yes. So, he just retweeted me. Um, I was excited. Yeah. So he, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see my first time doing stand up and you'll see Judd introduce me. Wow. No way. Are it's you fa- serious? It's fantastic. I'm 18. We're going to have to look that up. Yeah. yeah. No, that's amazing. Yeah. YouTube.com slash Graham Elwood. <laughs> but so that's the first time I did. I was a freshman at University of Arizona. How old was he? He was probably, you know, same same school though. You guys no, were... he was like touring with them, so he was already like making oh, his living genius. as a comic. Mm-hmm. Wow! So he was pro- he's probably ten years older than me. He was probably twenty eight, twenty nine. So funny. Um, so so yeah, I started doing comedy there, and then there was a sketch comedy troupe called um, Comedy Corner that actually was started by Gary Shandling, like in the late eight, late seventies, early eighties. Wow. And uh, it was a weekly sketch group. So I started doing that. So I started going to open mics at Laughs Comedy Club and then doing little shows around uh, campus. I did a fraternity party that where we literally stood on diving. I was a bunch of fraternity guys mm-hmm. in rafts in a pool. And a, there was a barbecue and we were... Yeah, I've done that. Uh, and you were performing on show. the diving board. Yeah, just about, we did yeah. a show. We yeah. stood yeah. on that was the diving the stage. board. We did that show at ASU or uh, SDSU. Yeah. Yes, we did. Yeah. Yeah. My first that was my first ever paying gig. I got wow. ten bucks and I still have the ten dollar bill. Do wow. you really? Yeah, I kept it. Oh wow. Never sell it. I feel like the day if the day I sell it, then I'm gonna I'm gonna die. Sure. See <laughs> Of course. <laughs> Don't use the ten dollar. Yeah, of course. It makes total sense. <laughs> That's how it works. We're just we're so fucking it's, it's medical crazy. Science. We're right the here. weirdest people, <laughs> breed of people in the world. I'm like, I can't throw out I, I I literally was like the other day, I was like, I can't throw out this action figure, even though his arm is broken and right. his, Head is doesn't move and everything's all jet. Ja- just can't do it. I have to you've keep a, it. You've what if some you mystical found a power? really good, delicious looking package of Doritos and a pack of gum, and they add it up to be ten dollars and it'd be like, I want to spend. Wait, I don't get it. So gum flavored Doritos. Gum flavored Doritos. Gum, wait, wait, wait gum is it gum that sounds like, like the, a Dorito? How does that work? How does this exactly? a barbecued <laughs> snackety gummity? I don't get it. Oh. So good. yeah, that's how I that's how yeah, I started. That's how you got started. And then I moved back to Chicago where I was from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And real quick, Cubs or White Sox? Cubbies, baby, North Side. All I right. was literally checking the Cubs score. So in three days we're gonna be fighting because you're coming to town to play my Dodgers. Yeah, oh, I doubt I'll go to a Dodger game because I don't want to get shanked. Um, you might get shanked here. I'm wearing a Raider shirt. It could happen. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty street. Um, quick update: Cubbies five, San Diego Padres nothing. Top of eight. Um, so yeah, I, I moved back to Chicago. <laughs> <That's> so funny. <laughs> That's your Harry Carey impression. That's I. I almost top of the ninth. Top of the ninth. I. I've always had like a, I've never. 
I was a sportscaster for my high school basketball team on uh -huh. a cable channel. Um, and in the back of my mind, I've never pursued it as a job or anything. But if I was anyone ever went, you want to be a sportscaster? You'd I'd be, be like, like, I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. My, yeah. AAA baseball in fucking mm -hmm. Nantucket? Down. Sure. Book it. I get it. Um, have I, you ever uh, gone to Chicago and been able to be like the person who leads them in the seventh inning stretch, take me out of the ballgame? No, I'm not, not yet. famous. You I know, threw out the opening pitch at a White Sox game, though. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Cool Major leagues. That? That's, that's good. What's what a I did big deal. I was with the Game Show Network. And yeah. White Sox fans booed me, which was great. <laughs> did they know you were a Cubs fan? No. Oh, they I had just a, booed you. I had a White Sox shirt because I don't dislike the White Sox. Yes. I, I like the White Sox, and I watched them when I was a kid in the 80s because I just loved living in a city that had two baseball teams. Mm -hmm. And so I got there like, from the game show network, Cram, ladies and gentlemen, Graham Elwood, man, you go so, you <laughs> blah, blah. I was like, oh, thank you, White yeah. Sox fans. That's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah, Damn. I'm happy. I, I I just got asked to do that, and I said no. And what? Then, where? Yeah. where? Which one? I'm not gonna. Well, I'm tell not me, gonna tell say, me the details because I'm, I'm gonna, gonna say where you. it is. I'm not gonna say where it is. What team? But I will do it at some point. So I don't want to say is it who in, it is because because then I'm. Uh, is it south of here? It is south. Okay, so the Padres. It look. It's south of there. South of Tijuana, Mexico? That's exactly where it is. <laughs> oh! The Tijuana Mexican baseball team. That's hey, who Did asked. you know uh, the great God Adrian Gonzalez plays first base for the Dodgers when he was a teenager, played on pro-am teams in Mexico in Tijuana? Really? Yes, because he's from San Diego. Um, uh, look, I'm not good at sports. I don't know anything about them. And let me tell you, the, the only thing I know about baseball is stuff I learned from a league of their own. I really don't know anything else. <laughs> you so know you know everything. you're not supposed That's to cry. It. That's um, it. No, there's no crying in baseball. I know that is a, a fact. You know um, you can be drunk in the dugout. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I've only been to one Dodger game, and when I went, I wore a three-piece suit, and I sat right behind home base, and I said, if you you screw this one up, we're, we're going to trade you. I just kept yelling that. <laughs> and they made me be quiet, and uh, they gave me a bunch of hot dogs to shut up. That's Good, a yeah. real thing that happened. That's excellent. You should, I went with David well, Pierce, look, my lawyer. I, I know <laughs> you're not going to be able to throw the ball over the plate, but you should go sing the national anthem. like. Because you can sing, you've yes. been on Broadway. Like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. That's what, maybe that's that's what you should do. Talk to your manager because that's yeah. a better gig. You have to, Nobody boos you singing the no. national anthem. Although you're Canadian, uh, so you probably yeah, don't even know it's it. It's going to be embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to mess. Unless it you up. walk out with that with like a ISIS shirt or something, yeah. <laughs> and then you make it, man. Uh, before we continue, I do want to. I want to talk to you guys about something that happened. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if we if we jump ship for a second yeah go for it all right i gotta i gotta talk to you about this because this happened today um i was on uh i was on facebook and a girl that i went this is the actual post you guys can see it's real okay mm -hmm. got it this is a girl that i grew up with we went to elementary school together she's a grown woman uh brian you're gonna appreciate this i'm gonna read this verbatim this is what she wrote uh, this is why i'm happy i don't have any kids i don't have any kids do you yeah, have any kids no way okay this do you have any kids brian Okay, Matt, you don't have any kids. Not that I know. I don't of. have any kids, and uh, and this is this is what a girl who's the same age as me, who grew up in the same town as me, who lives a block from my mom's old house. Mm -hmm. This is what she wrote: If you are a parent of toddlers, do not go to the Sky Zone in San Marcos. <laughs> <laughs> they charge the toddlers full price, twelve dollars for thirty minutes. What the hell? Then. Net off a specific area so your little only has about 12 squares where they can jump. Additionally, they can't access half the park because they're too little, like the basketball and dodgeball areas. Parents of littles can't jump for free, and we're not allowed to sit or rest anywhere except for one small square. After the third time of being policed, I gave up and I asked for a refund. Check yourself, Sky Zone. <laughs> <laughs> Your toddler jumping policy is greedy. <laughs> Very unsatisfied. <laughs> I just, I was oh. like, and here's the best part. How about this? Every, dude, every single comment is like, yeah, I'm right there with you. Like every, like all you the women are like, yeah, uh, absolutely. How about this? Tell her that I will volunteer to play dodgeball with her toddlers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I will like, throw a ball at her toddlers yeah. as hard as I can if she would like me to. I would volunteer <laughs> oh, gladly to do that. God. Like seriously, seriously, check yeah. yourself, Sky Zone. <laughs> <laughs> it was just made me, I just, it was, I loved yeah. that. I thought it was oh. great. Well, I'm glad somebody's keeping Sky Zone in check. <laughs> yeah. Right. There. Yeah. Thank seriously. God. Somebody had to do the tough work. So, Someone's so, got to take uh, him down a peg. 
Yeah. So let's <laughs> let's hop back into this. Yeah. Um, so you're doing comedy. You're doing comedy. You're doing stand up. How did uh, you? What was your first TV gig? The first just appearance or like full like full gig. Well, first appearance, and then we'll talk about full gig. The cause... first appearance. Well, I, my head like the so I did a I did a famous footwork commercial when I was eight. Oh wow! Where I held up a pair of Pumas and went, "I like knees," and so everyone were, at school made fun of me. Did did uh like when you were a kid, were you into like performing arts and stuff and all that or no? Kind of yes and no. I mean, my like my 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 father was a theater professor. Oh wow! So mm-hmm. I were was you doing plays and things. I kind of rejected it. I was just like, mm. you know, I think me and my brother, my dad. You know, there's four of us. So my daughter, my his daughters, my oldest sisters were into performing and stuff like that my brother and i were kind of meatheads so we were like sports i don't think my dad knew how to talk to us um we were just like you know it was the 70s and there was like peace rallies and we're like we want toy guns you know (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) Yeah. um so yeah but i did some and then i sort of rejected it like i didn't do drama in high school or anything like that but i did the sports so i played football in high school but then Mm -hmm. did the basketball games on the cable channel and that honestly was my first like huh this, I like this. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, we pre taped the intro. The games weren't live. So it was just me and another high school kid. And the there was a, a head, like, student who was like the head, you know, nerd. Mm-hmm. And this, the, perf- the teacher just sort of let He's this the guy kid. from the AV club who yeah, set it all up. Exactly. Yeah. The AV, he sure, s- he sure. set it all up. So his, his name was Jeff. And we got there and I'm like, can we pre tape the intro? And he's like, yeah, fine. I'm like, hi, Graham Allen alongside <laughs> Ted O'Connell at Evanston Township High School. To, you know, and I, I did this did whole thing. And he yeah. comes out and he goes, come on, man. You can't do that. You got to use your real voices. I'm like, these are real voices, Jeff. You know, like, and I just, I, I did jump to that and was like, this is kind of awesome. Yeah. And then the first time I actually did stand up on TV, I did the TBS New Year's Day Comedy Cure. Mm-hmm. How'd you get that gig? Paul Gilmartin, who I met doing stand up in Chicago, had moved to Los Angeles and he was uh, doing dinner and a movie on TBS. Okay. So they decided to, on New Year's Day, they were going to show a bunch of movies and with an intercut stand up comics. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. And it was all like comedy cure. So there's everyone's Alka Seltzer and whatever. Yeah. Because uh, right. everyone's hungover. So that was cool. And I did stand up mm-hmm. on TV and it was really like, it was wild. It was, I was on TBS, wow. and that was pretty cool. And then at the time, was that because uh, what year was that around that? Ninety six. That was okay. Yeah, it was New Year's Day ninety six. Now, did that because I know in today's market of doing comedy, like if you were starting out right now, and if you're just trying to do shows, whatever, you try to get on the road, and you haven't been on TV, it's just not going to happen. Like they're not going to book you anywhere doing real shows. So if something like that happens, you get a little bit of TV work. That all of a sudden, like did the world of stand-up open up to you a little bit more? I mean, it was kind of weird because I was, when I graduated from Arizona and moved back to Chicago, there was 14 full-time clubs in the Chicagoland area. Oh, yeah. And so I was with, I was waiting tables and within a year quit my waiting job and was just making my living doing stand-up. Wow, that's incredible. Emceeing and being a feature. I wasn't even headlining just because there was so much work to be had. Mm-hmm. I saw a documentary about the comedy clubs in, in Chicago, and it was just packed, man. It was I nuts. Mean, it was there crazy. Was the Funny Firm on Monday nights did an open mic. It was a 400-seat room, and it was fucking packed. Wow. It was standing room only Jesus. on a Monday night for open mic. So Chicago in 95 is like L.A. in 89 or something. Yeah, it was. This was, yeah, the early 90s is, because I graduated in yeah. 91, so they were still. It okay, was, yeah, early 90s are, yeah. It was still. The eighties, it was still riding off the boom from the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was nuts, man. And so so the point was, if you were decent and you had a decent fifteen minutes, it was mm-hmm. like we need MCs. And then you build that into a half hour, you start yeah. featuring. So I was it was weird. Before before I moved to LA, I was making my living as a road comic. Wow. So then I came to LA, I was like, Well, I don't want to stay on the road. I want to do film and TV. So like the TBS thing helped get more stage time around LA mm-hmm. and get more, like I got into working the improvs. I started emceeing the Irvine improv and the Brea improv nice. and sure. Yeah. And that was, that was big for that. And then I was not going on the road as that much. I was staying around and I was, I started auditioning. Um, I was in this act. I was in playhouse West, this mm-hmm. my, intense Meisner oh, acting yeah, school. Yeah, James Franco school. was in my class. Yeah. That whole, it's yeah, a big deal. It's a big deal. And so I was trying to be the serious actor. And then I got, my first like 
serious. I did a pilot. Was your dad like sort of very excited when you got into Playhouse West? Like, was that like a thing for him where he's like, he finally came around to his interests? I wonder. Yeah, I think he just sort of went because I be the stand up was. It just sort of seemed like, well, he's already performing and Marty making his living, so now he's just sort of expanding on that. Mm -hmm. That's nice, though. Um, and then I and then I got the strip poker. I did yeah. that, and that was a uh, that was the, my first like serious TV gig, and that was fun. So when it comes to because um, you know this uh, this book that you wrote that that you know that you mm -hmm. created here with uh, with Chris Mancini. Uh, it's such an in-depth look at um, at at film and and you know all different genres and genres that we would never right like you never see mentioned in uh in book in like in book form. So right. like for example, uh, just to give you an idea, mm -hmm. Matt, you would love this. So there's there's like you know fantasy, there's mm -hmm. westerns, there's science fiction, but then there's also rockin' movies. Yeah. So rockin' okay. movies would be like, like music theme not musicals but like detroit rock city yeah or movies about rock and roll stars or mm -hmm. rock, you like know almost famous like things like yeah that. stuff that, like that exactly yeah um the, you know animation action adventure war movies mm -hmm. so yeah. that was like i thought that was super cool and then film noir is a, is a section so is cops and robbers mm -hmm. uh so is film school classics which i thought was really really yeah. neat okay um, cult classics, martial arts movies, mm -hmm. uh, movies we're ashamed we like, <laughs> <laughs> sequels, trilogies, and franchises. Um, I loved it. I mean, it. They should totally... add a category for movies. I'm pissed off at Stephen Glickman for making me go see. Yeah, no, <laughs> that would be no, a category. This is a real thing. How did you get into being like a big film nerd? Well, like, how did this happen? Because I, because honestly, man, I would make Matt Walker. See every shitty, the <laughs> yeah, worst, <you're> horrible <laughs> movie in the movie okay. theater. Like He's I, dragged me to Mother's Day. Um, oh yeah, we talked. You talked yeah, about this we on did our a show. Whole episode about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the guy. Uh, okay, New yeah, Year's this Eve. Is the guy make him do this. Uh, he made me go see Jack and Jill with him. Wow. We went to go see Bucky Larson in the movie theater. Yeah, Bucky wow. Larson. The we Nick saw Swartzen movie. inappropriate movie. Yep, inappropriate comedy. Is that what it was? I think called? it was just inappropriate movie. God, it was terrible. Which is, and then they cut in scenes from the underground comedy movie because it was done by the same guy. Oh, it was one of the worst things I've ever. seen I think in we my were life. like the two people who saw that in the theater in America. Like that was it. It made like twelve dollars. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. If that, that we, like we saw just every bad movie. Yeah, I keep making him do that. And then Mike Black. And then we had like a whole a whole event of it when we went to see Annie. Yeah, we went to go see Annie. And we invited like a ton of people to come out with us, <laughs> we and got, we like, just five. all yelled out at the screen the whole yeah. time. It was so much fun. It was such That's a good a time. That one was at least sort of fun because there were more people. But yeah, but we we like going and seeing. I mean, I like going and seeing bad movies. Uh, here's the thing: is I, this is how I feel, and Graham just back me up on this. I think seeing a bad movie like that you know is bad in the movie theater is so much more enjoyable because right. it it's this grand scale like it's you get to see I mean, you know how much money they spend yeah. on p and a and and on the just getting it into the theaters and you know and then on the movie the you can marketing feel budget the money you can feel yeah. how much money has been sunk into this pile just wasted of shit on a pile of garbage yeah, well that's i think it's especially when you like are going with a friend with the specific purpose of we're gonna make fun of this movie like mm -hmm. that is so much fun yeah. The times I've done some like the shows like the Benson Interruption, some other mm -hmm. shows where you interrupt movies on a microphone. Oh. Uh, you know, Chris and I sometimes for our when we don't do a lot of live comedy film or shows, but we'll show trailers mm -hmm. and we usually pick some cool trailers and then we always try to find the dumbest thing. Yeah. Oh. Because there's nothing like making fun of a stupid movie. Yeah. It is so amazing. It's it's it feels so good. It's pure. It's it a pure really, moment. It, it <laughs> really, just... really is. Are there any well, terrible what? movies that you've seen trailers for that are coming out soon that you're looking forward to? Uh, yeah, The Great Let's Wall start. with Matt. Say, Don't say Stork. Storks say is going to be great, you <laughs> bastard. That's the Matt. Here, we're going to take a look. Let's take a quick right, look at upcoming movies. We're going to go down the list. Right. Is that okay? Let's sure. see what's coming out. All right. All right. Hang on. We're looking. But at while you're doing that, to answer your question, yeah. Chris Mancini and I uh, didn't know this, but we both we both went to film school, and then we became kind of friends as comics, and then both had short movies and festivals like 15 years ago. 
So he, we were sort of, he came to me back in 2007 and was like, why don't we start, it started as a website comedy film nerds where mm-hmm. we right. had like comedians writing funny movie reviews. And he's like, we both have some short films that are just kind of sitting on a shelf collecting dust. Let's sell some movies. Let's create a little store. We'll sell some comedians products. And we just realized that we were, we just loved movies and we had made some. And then everybody started doing a podcast and we would go on as the guests, as the comedy film nerds to talk sure. about this movie or Oscars or whatever. And people started going, why don't you? Why is that a show? Why don't you guys yeah. do your own thing? Yeah. So we did that. And then the podcast took off and became sort of the focus of what we're doing. And we were like, we got to come up with a book. Yeah. yeah. And because we had all these great writers that some of the names you read oh. were also guests on the show. They're so great. And Greg Proops is oh so damn God, good. Because they, and we, yeah. when we had, that was the great thing going back to the podcast. So they'd come on and we found out, you know, Proops loves film noir. We found out <laughs> Alan Havey is an expert on old war movies. You know, like we just, Jeez. we just found the, the strength of everybody mm-hmm. and sort of let them like, why don't you write a chapter? You know, oh, in the book. so cool. And then Chris and I wrote a bunch of chapters and it was just such a fun, it took, almost a, two years to make the book. That's mm-hmm. amazing. And it was so, it was so, it, it, it was so cool. Like, you know, podcasting in this new do-it-yourself world, I'm now a published author. I've directed oh, wow. my second docu- feature documentary and it's just like, it's, the, I'm going to do a comic book next year. It's, Hell yeah, it's, dude. It's so great. Oh, I mean, Graham, I'm so happy for you. You're, thanks. You're kicking ass. It's Let's uh, let's talk about uh, some upcoming movies. Um, uh, starting September second, we have um, there's there, there's a couple, but uh, the Light Between Oceans uh, with Michael Fassbender. Uh, Michael Fassbender, do you know? Oh yeah, that that looks interesting. So now, we're, as we get into September and October, we're starting to, starting get, to get the Oscar. In, we're contenders. starting to get some Oscar movies. Yeah. I think that's a that's that's going for a trophy. That film, yeah, probably. We also got Morgan, which is the Kate Mar- Mara. Kate Mara. That I don't know. That is a that uh, sci-fi movie. Uh, it, it, it looks very good. Um, it is a, a corporate troubleshooter. Kate Mara is sent to a remote top secret location where she is to investigate and evaluate a terrifying accident. She learns that the events were triggered by an innocent, quote unquote, human who possesses mysterious abilities. Uh, so. Now, is Rooney Mara her sister or cousin or how does that how are they related? I don't know. Because I know they're related in some way. And then they're both uh, related to the Rooney family who owns the Steelers and the Mara family that owns the Jets. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's who it is. Really? Yeah. Like, yeah. That's her grandfather or something, the guy who oh, owns the Jets. Wow. I don't know. That one looks or pretty did, cool. Because uh, they don't know him. Like, they, they sold him to Woody Johnson owns him now. But and look, everyone's giving shit to Kevin Smith about yoga hosers, and the percentage rating is, is not great right. on there. But I will fucking watch anything he does. I love Kevin Smith. I I'm down with him too. Cool. He's going to do something inventive. It's going to be does. something different, he and, and if, uh, he's one of those filmmakers. Yeah, it's not the same that, old, same old. It's not the same old. And if it if it's a swing and a miss, it's an interesting one. Absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. I remember reading something Roger Ebert once wrote where he talked about how like he'd rather see a movie that fails spectacularly while trying to do something great than a movie that accomplishes whatever they're trying to do, but it's just boring. Right. That's like, a he's great like, point. Like, give me a, give me a spectacular failure. Like, I think it was talking about the movie North. Right. And he's like, yeah. he's like, it takes a lot of really talented people to make a movie this bad because, like, they really went for it, and they failed this time, but there's some really good people right. who made this movie, right. and it was just awful, but... You know, well, we'll give those it. guys more shots, and then I, you're going to get something great. I, I love Kevin, and I think his his stuff is really neat. Like Tusk scared the shit out of me. Right, that mm-hmm. is a movie about a guy being turned into a walrus. Okay. Mm-hmm. That would never seem because you like, look in the mirror, you're like, "Oh shit, I'm halfway like, there. I'm a- <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's happening." Uh, it was good. I saw it coming, but it still got me. Um, I uh, I went to uh, I went to sleep after I saw it. I had nightmares for the first oh. night, and then the next day, I couldn't get it out of my brain. It freaked me out, and so did Red State. Red State mm-hmm. was freaky. That was a freaky, freaky movie. I couldn't see Tusk because I just heard that, and I was like, "I I know." All- I was too freaked out just at the premise. <laughs> It's it's it is absolutely jarring because they take it step by step and it does not end happy. Mm-hmm. It ends rough. Like it is right. a rough ending. I was really impressed and I was impressed Did that he get Kevin a bucket at the end. 
<laughs> well, you know the thing with Kevin is, is like you know you look at the old uh, you look at the old clerks like the first mm-hmm. clerks yeah. and how at the end he the guy was going to get originally shot he was going to get shot yeah yeah and it's like he gets to do a little bit of that in now he gets mm-hmm. to he doesn't always have to end things on a happy note yeah. or he can make weird fucking choices and yeah. have little uh, little Nazi creatures attacking people you know in a Seven Eleven which is yeah. what this movie looks like I can't wait <laughs> um, Skip Trace uh, Johnny Knoxville I'm skipping that one we're not going to talk about that one. Um, uh, and then we then we get into September 9th, which is we get Sully, uh, big oh, yeah, Warner Brothers, good. yeah, movie. It Tom looks Hanks, interesting, Tom man. Hanks is great, man. Uh, so he cool. just it's it's uh, Clint Eastwood for all of his uh, yeah. weirdo political stances. He's still one of the great filmmakers. He's still a great filmmaker, and the fact that like in the trailer, it's oh wait a minute, Sully is not. Maybe there not is not just a hero. He's yeah, not just a hero. Maybe there were some mistakes. Maybe that like yeah. Uh, uh, and Tom Hanks playing it. I'm I'm excited. To I'm see in. That yeah, film. absolutely. How um, weird is it though that Dirty Harry is like America's great filmmaker right now? I know he's like an American Kurosawa. He's, yeah. He really is. He's making movies this late in his life, and they're all really good and interesting. And it's yeah. it's fantastic. it's also weird that he's the one who made Bridges of Madison County, which is the one. That it just doesn't seem to fit with Clint Eastwood, but it's like it's such a good movie. Yeah, he's yeah. good. He's he's a he's phenomenal. Um, then we got uh, September sixteenth. We get to walk into Bridget Jones's. Pass. Wait, oh. yeah, Bridget Jones's baby is back I'm with so Renee glad. Zellweger's Show. new weird face. Yes. <laughs> so that's a thing. <laughs> I don't look. Why is this? Why? I just saw Renee Zellweger in mm-hmm. in a in the trailer for another new movie that actually looks pretty good. Um, that film is called uh, did something uh, something interesting, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, um, it's okay. It's all right. I got it. It's right here, and she's starring in a movie called A Same Kind of Different as Me. It's not a good title. No. Okay. It's not a good title. Uh, same kind of different as me, but it's Renee Zellweger. It's John Voight. It's um, uh, let's see who else is in this. Greg Kinnear is in this film, and uh, give me the correct. Give, Graham, you are you're better at this than me. Who is uh, who? What's what's his name right here? This fellow. Oh. Uh, Jimon Hunzu or her. Oh, that yeah, I can't Jimon pronounce that name. I can't pronounce that name. Yeah, let me, let me I made you guys. Shot. I made you guys yeah, say it. That, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks for making. Yeah, because I think they say so like the dumb American. Damon. Damon Hunzu. Hunzu. Yeah. Hunzu. Hans. Eric Peterkovsky, can you tell us the correct spelling? <laughs> You know he was in the movie, right? He was in that movie. That's He's in that movie with that guy from the thing. Don't worry about it. We can stuff. cut that out, Eric, if you want us to cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. Whatever. There. Let's. Yeah. He's let's a good jump. actor, though. He is a good actor, and, and that, that trailer that... looks really good. And I like that Greg Kinnear is because he got big from was it Master and Commander or something? Was that the first one he was in? He's a very talented, very yeah. talented actor. What? Yeah. Where is Where, where is Greg Kinnear? Oh, Greg been? Kinnear. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting. He's running a cheese shop in <laughs> South Florida. <laughs> He was nominated for an Oscar. He's a very talented actor. I, I don't know, know why. I don't know why people take breaks and why they vanish from things, and then you see them again. You're like, I'm so happy to see you. You know, like yeah. like there's a lot. There's a lot of them that then they you you hear about. They just van. People just vanish. Well, the the story I always go to is um, the guy oh, John Savage, right? Right. So he had that run. You know, he was in like Deer Hunter, mm-hmm. and he was like one of those. He was in that. Uh, J- John Cazale and yeah. and De Niro, and it was just like he was one of these guys. And then he, from what I understand, just sort of like, nope, kind of done with Hollywood and it's bullshit. Like lived mm-hmm. in Africa, worked in a, like in an orphanage. Like he wow. just sort of checked out for a while. Which, wow, like the the people that have the meltdowns and the drug. Okay, well, like that, where's Brendan Fraser? Right, like where is he? He runs a golf and stuff. Yeah. Oh, does in, he? Uh, really? I yeah, didn't know. Panorama yeah. City. Panorama it's, it's, City. It's great. <laughs> I'm going to head on over there. I need to get some golf and stuff. So, <laughs> But, you know, I think some people, like Freddie Prince Jr. or whatever, because if you think about that, when you get to that level oh, of Oh, by the way, Freddie yeah. Prince Jr. is currently working. I don't know if you know that. He's on. He's the host of the TV show Impress Me, an impression comedy show where comedians do impressions. 
Uh, it's hosted. Is that the one with Dana Carvey? Hosted, yes, it is. It's Dana Carvey is a judge on the show, and then uh, Dana brings on his friends with him, and they judge people's impressions. And it's hosted by Freddie Prince Jr. Do you know why it's hosted by Freddie Prince Jr.? Uh, no. Neither does anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows. No one knows. Yeah, I thought he said I'm out of show business and I don't. I, I'm taking a break, and he just just. Well, <sighs> he sort of is. I mean, let's be honest. All right, that's hardly right. show business. Okay, yeah, listen. All right. all right, Blair Witch is coming back. They're doing yeah, a remake of the Blair Witch project. It's not a remake, is it? It's a sequel. Well, no, I- it's called Blair Witch. I don't know, dude. It's got a hundred percent score on Rotten Tomatoes. Can't trust Maybe Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know. You can't trust anybody. Well, because they've done they've like they got bought by a big movie company. Like Ooh. it's I I I just okay. I look at it with a grain of salt. Okay. All right. Um well it should be interesting. I don't know. Adam Wingard is directing it. I've known Adam Wingard for about fifteen years. He's a phenomenal director. Mm-hmm. It's very if they possible. do it again the right way, they take that premise and like, because mm-hmm. the problem with the original one, it was the first found footage which made was, people nauseous because yeah, it was too much handle, made you nauseous. Yeah. Right. But they never showed you anything. The, yeah, the, it, it, a friend of mine said this. Uh, it, it'd be like if you went to go see Jaws and all you saw was the fin and the heard fin, the music. Yeah, mm-hmm. bum, 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 bum. And the shark never came out of the water. No, yeah. never attacked it. Never. You just. When is it coming? Yeah. yeah. Well, in their defense, they made the movie for like what twelve grand or something. They had yeah, no money have, when they made but it. But you can yeah, have a they witch. They were broke when they made get that a movie. Witch. It should be interesting. Get a witch. What? You can't get a witch. Get a fucking witch. <laughs> I can get you a witch. Yeah. Get a guy in a weird hat and yeah. run around. They just had a weird, creepy thing where you stood in the corner, yeah, facing away. In the corner. corner. Yeah. What about uh, what about Snowden? You excited about this, jo- Joseph Gordon-Levitt? It I could li- be good. I like me some some JGL. Mm-hmm. Um, I know he's trying hard to sound exactly like Edward Snowden. I yeah. don't think he should have done that. I don't but think so either. You know what? We're only watching the trailer at this point. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a chance that by watching the movie, it'll kind of go away. It'll be normal at some yeah. point. You'll just make... accept it. Maybe just it's just too it? jarring in the trailer. It's just way, weird in the his trailer. movie, Don John, was fantastic. <laughs> it was. It was really fantastic. Good. Did you see it? Oh, wait. Yeah, wait. It was Scarlett Johansson. Yes. Yeah, yeah about, you're right. Oh, yeah. I was thinking that's, movie. that's a very good movie. Because that's what he wrote and directed and had... Uh, who is it? His family was like old. these people from like uh, who was it? I remember like his dad and his mom. Oh, it was movie. Tony Danza. Tony yeah. Danza. That's who it was. So yeah, good. no, it was good. It was really. It was. It started out as this sort of bro comedy, and then it was like, oh wow, we're really going to get into like a weird yeah. sex addiction, and, and and it was him like picking Julianne Moore over. That was great. Scarlett Johansson. You were like, oh, this was actually really. That's well what done. I'm saying. I love. Yeah. I love Joseph Gordon-Levitt, but like when he uh, last year he did that. That French, um, the movie about the, the the French trapeze guy that walked through the walked across yeah. the the yeah. twin towers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And he hit this French cuisine or whatever that was like, oh, dude, no, yeah. And it was a movie, and th- this is now his second movie that has a really compelling documentary about the guy. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah, Citizen right. Four. Man on Wire. Man on Wire is yeah. great, and Citizen Four is really great. Mm-hmm. So oh, I'm wondering, yeah, yeah. is this? Is he watching documentaries to... and be like, let's make that into let's a regular a movie. movie? I'll do a wacky accent. How how do you feel about uh, Magnificent Seven? I'm all for it. Yeah? I think it's going to be the box office hit of that weekend. You better, <laughs> you son of a bitch. You're the worst person I know. <laughs> no, his movie comes out against Same, Yeah, Seven, we come so. at, it's coming out against it. So <laughs> yeah. uh, But it's but completely, it does look good. completely different uh, demographic. I yeah, think, yeah. I believe so. I believe you guys got an animated sure. movie about babies and birds. And yeah, yeah, yeah. This one's really good, though. It's got Denzel Washington. It's got Matt Bomer, who I adore. I think he's great. It's got yeah. Vincent D'Onofrio, Ethan Hawke, Chris Pratt. All it's a great lineup. People. The original Magnificent Seven was obviously a Western remake mm-hmm. of uh, The Seven Curacao. Samurai. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's I'm all for it. Yeah. That's the kind of movie where I think it's been long enough, and if they do it right, it can be good, unlike what they did with Ben-Hur, which just flopped oh, you know, like it's crazy. So, what's so weird is, though, is that ev- like I was talking to people the week before Ben-Hur came out, and everyone was like, oh, my God, that movie is going to be amazing. It's going to be huge. It's going to kill— and then nothing. nothing. And made eleven and a half million dollars opening weekend. So, so does oh. it feel like nothing is safe? Like we don't know what's gonna. I feel like if like Ice Age this because Ice Age had come out earlier this year and it was mm-hmm. it did not do well. And I kind of feel like if it had come out two years ago, maybe or a different year, it just seems like maybe. Uh, Maybe it's just a, maybe it's a weird year. There is weird timing things. Like you have to get your movie to come out at the right time against the right stuff. And well, yeah. honestly, to yeah. me, what it, it comes down to is who 
is in charge of the film. Who made Ben Hur versus you know Magnificent Seven uh, is a uh, it, now it's Antoine Fuqua. Which my problem with Antoine Fuqua movies is he makes always makes a great first act or two, and then his movies really fall apart. What mm-hmm. other movies has he done? Well, here you? the biggest example for me is Training Day. So I love the beginning of Training yeah. Day. I love the first act of it. I love the premise of Denzel Washington. That that quandary, like, mm-hmm. did the did the did the means, you know, did the ends justify the means? And yeah. Then the movie just evolved. Denzel Washington just became it sort of falls apart. Pure evil. He's just yeah. a pure criminal, and there's no there's no compelling, like the the thing to me in a in a, in, a, in a cop drama is you know that's the that's the question that's the question we're still asking as a country, <laughs> like right. you've got all these really brutal criminals, but does that mean a cop can just sort of go outside the law and gun people like yeah, that to me is always interesting and and Ethan Hawke as the young rookie in that I mean it was really cool, but then it just it just it's it just keeps happening that Jake Gyllenhaal boxing movie starts mm-hmm. out very sort of compelling and he loses his life and then it just always kind of falls apart. So that's my concern with Magnificent yeah. Seven. Interesting. That's like another director who he won't, who Glickman won't let me mention where I like the beginning of his movies and then I think they fall apart. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can, we can talk about it. Uh, like I, cause you know what? I mean, everybody's different. Everyone has their own opinion mm-hmm. on stuff. I'm, I particularly really enjoy Judd Apatow, and I really like mm-hmm. his movies. I like him as a person. And I mm-hmm. like. I tend to like stuff. the first half of Judd Apatow movies, and then I'm like, "Why is this movie three hours long? And why did it change to a completely different movie halfway through? Because it seems like that happens all the time now." But Trainwreck things. wasn't that. I mean, Trainwreck. Well, I didn't see Trainwreck. Train, well, Trainwreck was handled very, very well. I feel yeah. like. Maybe like, but like Funny People is the one that just kills me because I'm like, I loved the first half of Funny People, and then they go to San Francisco, and I'm like, this is a completely different yeah, movie yeah, I'm watching. Yeah. It went from being a comedy about stand up that was fun to being like this weird drama where he's breaking up a marriage, and I'm like, what the hell just happened yeah, here? Yeah. Like, how did that happen? Well, like, I think I think the thing maybe I I don't know how much Apatow listens to people and to critics and to you know stuff that's out there in the world. But it seems like maybe from like forty year old Virgin is a perfect movie. It's great, great movie. Yeah, um, I feel like Train Train Wreck is a perfect movie. I really like that a lot. Every once in a, while, I feel like maybe you know, like maybe there's a couple movies in the middle there where uh, they're really fun movies and they go on for like maybe a little too long or a little longer than most comedy movies would go on for but maybe he's heard so much from people of saying like ah oh, you got to cut this down and whatever that i think he listens to people i don't think he's past the point of listening for advice and mm-hmm. listening to uh fans and listening to his editor and listening to the people that he works with like um Someone like George Lucas, who just stopped listening to who stopped listening to to the world around yeah. him and yeah. only listens to like himself and the people in his sure. circle, you know that I feel well, like I feel like he's I think just and the only reason I feel like that is because Apatow comes out to do stand up and he hangs out mm-hmm. and then after his sets he goes well, what did you what did you think and people people give him go oh I love this joke or that was joke oh maybe you should tag this with this and he listens to people mm-hmm. so I feel like he's still listening well, the to the thing with when George Lucas filmmaking is I think we found out that maybe he's really not the guy who made Star Wars and produced Empire and produced Jedi but maybe he's the guy who produced Howard the Duck and that's just who he is <laughs> I think that's what we found out with the prequels like that's just who he is well I don't know here's I mean I'm not to jump into into Star Wars with you Matt Walker but uh you know let's do it uh here's here's how I feel about it I feel like those first three movies he was so limited in mm-hmm. what he could make and what right. he could do yes and when you're limited force them to be creative it and do forces amazing you things. to be creative and limitations do amazing are a gift. Yeah. yeah, it's a gift, and and it's great because then when then when you go to the prequels, and also like oh now we've got all this new technology. But like he got drunk on the technology when yes. with the the reboots of the first three when he put the the yeah when he changed the, them all yeah and they added all this computer yeah. stuff and it was just sort of like he, it was just put in there just because he could yeah that's that's why I believe that 
like he made those first three movies and he did a great job with those first three movies. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he was there and he was doing everything he yeah. could to have his vision, you know, uh, created the best to his ability. Just like in the script, he was like, oh, I really want this. Uh, I want to see on this on the screen. I want to see the computer image of the, you know, of, of the of the, um, you know, one of the uh, what was the Banthas? No, about? no, no! Like it was the computer image of one of the stormtroopers' ships that they were flying in. Uh, in it, I'm forgetting what the oh the X wing or the Tie fighter. It was a Tie or, fighter. Yeah. There was like a mm -hmm. Tie fighter. They wanted to see the Tie yeah. fighter, and so um, he had a computer company uh, create from scratch, and it took months and months and months to and you know to render out the mm -hmm. image right. that goes on the screen that that you see. That's the uh, the computer image of the Tie fighter, but like. He was doing everything he could to have his vision brought to life in those first three movies mm -hmm. because the technology was so limited, right? Yeah. And then, you know, these movies, those those prequels are horrendous. They're awful. They're so hard to watch. And I've gone back recently, and I bought all the original three, and I was on a plane, so I was like, I'm gonna watch the the, the first the, these these you know original three, and I mean not the original three, the uh, the prequels. I'm gonna watch the prequels and just see if. If I is really do hate it as much as I thought I would, mm -hmm. and good God, they're fucking hard to watch, especially the first one with Jar Jar Binks and the beginning and the, well, Jake and Lloyd the underwater is... stuff, and you're like, it looks like a cartoon. It looks terrible. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, and I think going back to to, to Jed Apatow, so that the, the Lucas thing, well, anything when you get that big and famous and everyone is telling you yes. Mm -hmm. sure. And I think that's a, that's such a problem in the comedy world because you come up with a comedy and you're however you break out as a comedian, you're a funny stand up and then you become you get to do movies or whatever. There's such a gritty and you got to fight and does this work? Does mm -hmm. this not work? And then you get some success and then everyone just laughs at anything you say <laughs> because yeah. it, it, it's for their financial end yeah. gain. You go in those writers' rooms and everyone's like, "Yeah, ha ha!" And it's like, "Wait a minute, that's you." Need I picture that being the pitch meeting for Jack and Jill, where they're like, "Yeah, that's uh, gonna be brilliant." You know, and we'll it's get just, Al Pacino; he'll uh, do it. <laughs> yeah. And then, so, so I think why what you're saying about Judd Apatow is good because he is asking people, and I and I I don't know, but my guess is like with Trainwreck, he, not to take any credit away from mm -hmm. credit away from Judd Apatow, but I think he said, "Hey, Amy." Right. Like what how do we how do like let's do this? Like what do you think? He didn't just come in and go, ah, you know, yeah. I'm yeah. Judd and 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 mm -hmm. you know that like that some of the I do not get the vibe from him at all that he is a guy who's like, I'm a big deal. You listen to me. I don't get that at no, all. I don't think that's yeah. him at all. I think but. I think it's very like he wants like I think he wants the best possible movie, but then at the same time, he's got a lot of his friends and a lot of really, really, really funny people mm -hmm. that he's letting kind of go and be funny. Mm -hmm. And it's it's got to be it's got to be difficult because I edit and I cut stuff. I'm cutting yeah. a thing for nighttime show right now with super funny people that we're friends with. And I'm watching this thing and picking the moments and not just using everything that's funny is very, very difficult. It is difficult mm -hmm. to, to cut and edit that stuff, and what do you keep in and what do you not? And when you work on a project, any project, you get too close to it. Yeah. Like, that happened with me with the earbuds, a documentary. Mm -hmm. I'm in the editing room. I've watched all of this, I've and I needed to, like, show it to some... I needed fresh eyes on it because mm -hmm. I'm sure. just like, I don't know... You're completely tuned out on it. You're completely tuned out, yeah. and I think... I've even done that just as um do you ever like just put it aside for a week and like yeah. not look at it and you come back and you're like okay, let me watch this with some sort I had of to do take? that. Yeah. I had to cuz I was like just getting all the footage and was just sitting in my apartment watching it and I was just like I don't and I would like call Chris Mancini and be like I don't what do we do is, <laughs> what is are we there a guy in this or what do we like and yeah. you have to do that and I think especially in the comedy bubble I mean you see that when you have a funny TV show and it starts to lose like what happened? What, what, what happened between season three and four? And it's mm -hmm. like, you got to infuse fresh writers in there and you got to, yeah. you got to, it's, it's a tough. Yeah, like Seinfeld was like a new writing crew almost every year. That it's was crazy. by design. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, we ran into that a little on big time rush where season one, two and three were like, 
the, well, season one and two were fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. Like great, funny episodes, killer stuff. And then season three, things got a little comfortable and a little weird. And they were like trying to figure out how much of like the real world they wanted to bring into it. And then they brought in, uh, I think they brought in Jessica Gao at some point who wrote on Silicon Valley, Mm -hmm. who's a genius writer. And she wrote some really, really funny episodes. And they brought in a couple other people who were really brilliant. And, uh, And then season four was like, it was weird. It was like, it was one of those things. Like there's a lot of great episodes in each season, but I think, you know, the first few seasons are always like, you know, they're killer. They're I think that great. happens. You get comfortable. I was talking with a guy that was a co-executive producer on a lot of big shows. And he said, what happens to writers when, it, especially when you get on a show that's like some juggernaut, like Seinfeld mm-hmm. or something yeah. like that. Um, Seinfeld's not the great example because he he wanted he rotated the staff when them yeah. when the ones don't rotate the staff he goes sometimes you get these writers in there and they think this is what the world is yeah and then it isn't you just hit, hit this light you know you found lightning in a bottle or you cast it really well not to take anything away from the writers but then the show just becomes this big financial you know yeah machine. And everyone just thinks, and and then they're just in writers. They think just, that's just how it works. This is how it is. Anything just, we come up with is going to be it's gold. gold. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. He saw a lot of them. Then they would get a development deal. Mm-hmm. You know, go off to somewhere else, and it just doesn't work. And it didn't work. Yeah. And it was so like, weird. it was interesting to hear that from someone that's working yeah. inside of now, it. Now, can I ask you about uh, stepping back in your career a little bit? Because uh, yeah, Glickman knows I'm the biggest game show nerd that there ever was. Yeah. Uh, and you were on a show called Cram that I used to watch back in the day in 2003, 2004, somewhere yes. in there. Oh, yeah. So the concept of the show, if I remember correctly, because I haven't seen it since it was on, you took someone, you kept them up for 24 hours you straight. Took a couple. You a two, couple. Two couples, and they competed against yeah, each other. Yeah, and then they had, like, books they could study that they are going to be tested on, was right. that? And you they were in, like, a glass box on Hollywood Boulevard, something right. kind of like that, where yeah. people could walk by and, like, Get see these people. Get out of here. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. And it, it was, was it was it a was fun bri- show to watch. It was sounds amazing. It was fun. It was brilliant marketing. There was this guy Bob Bowden who is like the most. He, his garage could be a game show museum. Mm-hmm. He loves game what? shows. He started as a like a as an page or an intern on on. Uh, I think the Price is Right, and they hired him at Game Show Network. He was the VP over there, mm-hmm. or the co executive, whatever. And he was like, "We're gonna take Game Show Network and make it." this thing that's when that, they started making a lot of their own shows because yes. before that it was all reruns oh, of old was. stuff sure yeah, yeah. which was great mm-hmm. but he was yeah, like something had your show they had the one with kennedy uh kennedy which had. was the, on the prisoner's dilemma i forget exactly. Russian 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 kennedy from Russian Russian was a good one yes yeah i had such a crush on her and yeah. duff yes oh duff yeah. they were too hotties <laughs> they were so hot <laughs> um there was uh jimmy pardo had funny money yeah that was a good one too um you had lingo you mm-hmm. had you had and and bob Bowden helped create all those shows and so it was brilliant marketing, but then they, they, you know, they're owned by Sony and it just, they didn't, they didn't promote, they could, it could have been this runaway hit. And then they decided to go, we're going to rebrand it to GSN. Yeah. Game they show network. You yeah. had it. It's there. Everyone yeah. knows what it is. And now GSN, yeah. you're like, what is GSN? Well, yeah, nobody cares. It's any channel. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, Cram was, they keep you. The other thing up. they need to do. Is every show should have the host have one of those long skinny microphones, yes. which they did away with. Every game show should have that. That's I'm right, Bob. I've, I agree. It I should love be, it. Yeah. You know that Gene Rayburn long skinny the, microphone the periscope. Jeff Perry from Card Sharks. Yes. do that jog out and hey everybody, and it was oh, smooth. Yeah. Yeah. He's the one that I think they based Guy Smiley on uh, Sesame Street on. Mm-hmm. Oh. It was Jim Perry? Yeah. Yeah. Matt Walker is a. Uh, uh, you we're, we're all f- comedy film nerds at this table, yes. but I'll tell you what, this guy is a game show nerd <laughs> to the point of like, I mean, knows everything about. I watch every reruns game. of Match oh, yeah. Game seventy seven. Any uh, chance I get hosting oh, yeah. game shows was I, I didn't move out here to do it. That's my dream job. It was the most fun. It was so much fun. It was such great work. Um, I would gladly do one again if they ever brought mm-hmm. him back. Uh, I it was really cool. You know, is is it was I've met. So many fun people, yeah. and it was I'll such a cool I'll watch all the experience. new ones. It was so fun. I watch all the new ones, and there's one on now that drives me crazy because the announcer for the show is Kira Soltanovich, and they're wasting her as the announcer because she says everything funny on the show. She should be hosting this show right. instead yeah, of just being I the agree. announcer. I love Kira Soltanovich. Kira's, she's, she's amazing. Because she's amazing. Sorry. And this show, I'm watching, I'm just like, swap the roles, yeah. the host and the, the announcer right there. Swap it. Yeah. And mm. that show would be so much better. Yeah. Yeah. 
I always liked the show Double Dare, uh, and mm-hmm. I always liked the show Mark American uh, Gladiators, but I feel like I would have broken my leg if I was on American <laughs> Gladiators. I'd be like the one Jewish guy running up like, Hawk oh, would shoot the- you with a tennis ball cannon. Don't shoot me, Falcon! I just get <laughs> shot in the face. <laughs> Nitro, what are you doing? <laughs> Why, Nitro? Why? <laughs> it hurts so much. Uh, Listen, we have to wrap up. Yeah. This is, we, you need to come back. And sure, you need whatever to, you want me to You need to come back Love and come, come back. hang out. Uh, maybe uh, bring uh, Mancini with you. You we got can, it. We can go through the next big chunk of movies that are coming out. I'm in. Um, tell us, tell the, our audience where they can find you. So uh, you can go to comedyfilmnerds.com. That's our, our website. You can buy all of our products, the books, everything like that. We Buy them. Buy them, guys. Uh, and of course, you can listen to us. We're in iTunes. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go to iTunes.com slash CFN, we have our own page with a bunch of stuff you can get CFN, to. CFN, you have comedy film nerds. It's right there. What are you shorting for? That's it. <laughs> 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 uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then we're at comedy film nerds on Twitter mm-hmm. and, and Instagram and all that. And of course, I'm Graham Elwood at Graham Elwood, GrahamElwood.com. And then. Uh, where Come can on. they get tickets for the L.A. PodFest? Go to LAPodFest.com. It's September 23rd through the 25th. Mm-hmm. All different kinds of tickets. And then if you want to watch the pay-per-view, that's only 25 bucks. But use coupon code CFN. Save yourself 5 bucks. Yeah. Thank you, guys, man. This was so much fun. Yeah. Oh, you're great. terrific, awesome. man. This was a lot. It was a really good time. Anytime I, you want I love, I love sitting down, sitting down and uh, chatting about fun, fun stuff. Matt. Mm-hmm. Where can they find you in the world? Uh, well, you can see Judd Apatow retweeting me, even though I don't like his movies very much. <laughs> oh, is, come, come on, on buddy. Man. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Give me a no, break. I do like some of his movies, so I'll say that. Uh, you can find me online. Just look for Funny Matt, and I'm on every website as Funny Matt. Go to a careersuicide.com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Judd Apatow can let me know what he thinks at mattwalkersucks.com. There we go. I love that. Um, yeah. Of course, I'm uh, Stephen Kramer Glickman. Uh, I love Judd Apatow. I would love to be in one of your movies. Yeah. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you, uh, you can always get me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Stephen Glickman, S T E P H E N Glickman. Don't forget to subscribe to the Nighttime Show podcast and leave comments on the iTunes page. If you don't, I'm going to find you at your home and I'm going to stab you yes. to death in your sleep. Um, thanks for listening to the show. We love you. And, uh, yeah, if you're in the Los Angeles area, mm-hmm. come on out to the nighttime show live at the Hollywood Improv. Mm-hmm. Uh, just go to the uh, Improv's website. Uh, go check it out. You go to the calendar, yeah. and you'll always see it. It's one you of the Saturday night shows. September 20, uh, no, August 27th, August September 27th. 24th, and then who knows after that, somewhere yeah. at the end of October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, this will come out um, in about a week or so, so it'll be... Okay. It'll be uh, yeah. next show. Will be September. 20- go to the LA Podfest during the day and come to our show. Yeah. The there you go. The That's, That's, the That's the perfect day. That's the plan to do it. Make it happen. Yeah. Go there for lunch. Come here for dinner. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot for listening. We love you guys. Peace. Peace.